Good afternoon, everybody on Educated Economist here. So in this video, I'm going to talk about what's going on in the economy, and it's probably going to be very different from anything that you are hearing out there in the mainstream media or from a lot of the other YouTubers. I really honestly feel like I have found their secret. Like, I have figured it out what it is that they are truly doing with their monetary policies, and it's not what a lot of people are feeling out there. It's not what they think, especially when it came to the inflationary scenario that we have just experienced. So, again, I'm going to try and break this down, and I'm going to try and make it very simple. A lot of times people tell me that once I start diving into the stuff and I get going, that I get into some very heavy topics. I start using language that is over their head, and they tell me that I start sounding like I'm speaking gibberish. That is not what I want for these videos. I really want to be able to put out videos in which that anybody can follow and then be able to have a discussion about you know, as far as like the information that I put out there, I don't want it to be confusing because the economy is a very confusing topic, especially when it comes to a lot of the economists out there who are explaining things. They talk in a way that is like, is almost as if they speak in code, right? And if you're not really privy to their lingo, then it makes it very difficult to understand what it is that they are trying to say. Now, I'm going to Again, I'm going to break down what it is that I feel is taking place within the economy right now. And again, it's like there's a lot of working parts and pieces here. So if I if I end up backtracking a little bit or I, you know, you kind of sound like I'm almost being a little remedial on it. Um, I, I'm trying to make sure that I'm covering all the bases because there's a lot of people who are trying to figure this stuff out for the first time. And this is really important information. I mean, if I put out, you know, a video that is just doesn't make sense to somebody, then there's no point in making the video at all. So let's talk about what's happening right now with the Federal Reserve, because there's big news all over the mainstream media talking about this supposed pivot, right? Like the Federal Reserve is now going to be moving their interest rates into a lower position from here, and it's going to happen sometime in 2024. Now, there's a couple of things to think about, right, before we even like, you know, imagine what it is that's going to be like when the Federal Reserve does go to move their interest rates. We have to think about the lag time that takes place because when the Federal Reserve adjusts their Fed funds rate, there's a lag time that begins to take place from the time that they have adjusted it to the time that it fully impacts the economy. And now there's no real set measure to this lag time. It can be anywhere from six months to a year. And there's a lot of people who say with the forward guidance, the Federal Reserve coming out and saying what they're going to do before they do it, that forward guidance. They say with this that it can move that lag time up, right, so that maybe it's only three months or six months or something like that. But ultimately, for the longest time, if you've ever studied Fed funds adjust adjustments, then it's usually six months to a year is what people will say, even a year and a half, right? But nobody knows exactly what that lag time is. Point being, there's a lag. Right? From the time that they adjust rates to the time that it impacts the economy, both lowering and raising it. Same same lag. Right? Now, when we think about this lag period, right now the Federal Reserve is talking about pivot, but they're not really talking about a pivot. The mainstream media is talking about the Fed talking about a pivot, but the Fed's not talking about a pivot. Now, I know this is a lot of talking going on, right? But if you think about it for just a minute, right, the Federal Reserve has what they refer to as the FOMC, right, the Federal Open Market Committee. The Federal Open Market Committee is a group of people who vote on monetary policy. A lot of times we'll hear like even the Jerome Powell pivot, right? Jerome Powell is just a spokesperson for the FOMC. He has a vote, right? So it is important. You know, he's an important person there. But ultimately, his job there is to speak on behalf of the FOMC. He doesn't really make decisions for the Fed, right? He just has his vote, right? So he can decide on his vote. And he can give his, you know, his opinions and his guidance and stuff like that to, you know, to reflect what it is that he feels is taking place within the economy. And then the other committee members can listen to that and decide whether or not that's valid information for them to vote on, right? So... Again, like when we think about what it is that the pivot is, the pivot is really when the Federal Reserve actually does an adjustment. What all the mainstream media is talking about is a dot plot map, right? Now, there are certain aspects of the economy that people look at in today's fashion that gives them the projection that they will be adjusting interest rates to a particular level. 
That is a few of the members of the FOMC. That is not the entire FOMC. Okay? And in fact, coming out right after this Powell pivot statement was many of the FOMC members like John Williams saying that there's no talking of pivot in sight, that they are not discussing this lowering of interest rates. Right? John Williams is the president of the New York Fed. And then in a speech coming out from Michelle Bowman, given just, you know, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, she, also a voting member on the FOMC, stated that there's most likely in her base case scenario that there would be more raising of interest rates going into the future. So she's talking exactly opposite just two weeks ago. This whole confusion within the market is part of their monetary policy, right? It's called credible threats. That's my coined term. They use signaling, forward guidance, jawboning, but it's ultimately the words that the Federal Reserve is using and the mainstream media's attention to that that is really guiding the market. You think about it, what happened to the market as soon as this information came out? Boom, right? They shot up like a rocket. People who have been following me on this channel know about the credible threats through the story of the guy who invents a gold machine. So I'm just going to tell it real quick so we understand. If you can imagine that a guy invents a gold machine, with this gold machine, he could produce as much gold at will with very little cost or energy. The moment that this information gets out to the markets, the price of gold would plummet immediately before the guy even produces a single ounce of gold, before he even has the machine to do it, right? Just the credible threat alone that he can do it would be enough to start adjusting the markets. This is what we experienced just recently with the Powell pivot, right? That's essentially the same thing as the gold machine. So, excuse me. <clears throat> so now we have to think about what is happening right now with the Fed funds rates, right? What is happening with the economy? What's happening with inflation? There are so many working parts. It gets very confusing. And then a lot of people want to start throwing politics into the mix of it. And then it gets even more confusing with it. Let me kind of explain it real quick so that we can understand, we can grasp this you know, this understanding of where it is that the Federal Reserve is positioning themselves. Because again, don't follow the mainstream media. Don't listen necessarily to what their statements are coming out on mainstream. Even these, these Fed officials, these members of the FOMC, they're going to come out and they're going to do interviews on mainstream media. This is the signaling. This is the forward guidance. Okay. That's not what you, I mean, you can listen to it because they, what they're stating in those, in those interviews is factual stuff. It's not lies, right? But the problem with it is, is that the way that they are conducted is, it, they're conducted in a way that is gaslighting. They have you convinced of certain things that are going to be taking place when that's not really what they have intended, right? A lot of it is like, just for an example of it, is that the 2% target, right? 2% target inflation rate. It's not. It's a 2% average inflation rate over time that the Federal Reserve is going for, right? But they don't come out and really state it. They don't state it clearly, and they don't indicate to the people they're going for an average inflation rate over time. This is one of the reasons why people were so confused when the Federal Reserve was keeping interest rates low during a time when inflation was running hot. They were allowing inflation to run extra hot, extra long for an extended period of time because they were trying to make up for the fact that they did not achieve their 2% target over the last 10 years. Right? So they changed everything about the way that they are doing this now. Not only do they change the way that they you know, calculate inflation, but then they also change the way that they conduct themselves with their monetary policy to no longer go to a 2% target, but to go to a 2% average inflation rate over time. Very important to understand. And I know right there that like, see, even there I was trying to be, you know, like if you didn't get everything that I just said, maybe you just go back and rewind the video and, and listen to it again, because really that is what is what's happening here. OK, let's let's move on. Let's talk about what's happening with the Fed funds rates now. OK, because the adjustment of Fed funds rate, typically the Fed would want to lower the Fed funds rate which is, let me, let me kind of explain that. The Fed funds rate um, up until recently was the overnight lending rate between the big banks. So at the end of the day, some of the big banks were in need of reserves. Some of them had excess reserves. The ones in need of reserves would lend them to the ones who, um, I, the ones who were in need of reserves would borrow them from the ones who had excess reserves. That overnight lending rate 
was the effective fund rate, which was what the Federal Reserve would consider their Fed funds, right? Because the Fed fund is just a target. It's as if they wrote it on the wall, right? The overnight lending rate was the effective fund rate. That was the basis of all lending after that. I don't want to get into too deep because really it's much different from that because they moved that effective fund rate over to the repo facility on interest on excess reserves because they had an abundant reserve system due to the quantitative easing. This is very confusing all on its own, but I don't think it's necessarily important for what we are going to be discussing today, right? Um, it will come up important in the future because we are going to have liquidity issues, especially when they start shutting the repo facility down and then moving the moving the effective fund rate back over to the interest on excess reserves. Or oh, I'm sorry, the <laughs> good Lord moving the effective fund rate back over to the overnight lending rate. Now, whether or not that happens, I don't know yet, but that is a possibility. Again, I'm not going to get into that because that's like way deeper than we need to even get here today, going off on a tangent, really. Okay, let's talk about the Fed funds rate again. The Fed funds rate, typically the Fed would want to drop interest rates around 5% in order to stimulate the economy. So if they were running into recession, Federal Reserve would drop interest rates 5%. This dropping of interest rates would then spark a lot of people out there to start borrowing money, buy houses, cars, go on vacation, stimulate the economy, right? And so if you look at a chart of the Fed funds rate, and I'll leave it down in the description, it from like the early 50s, here, I'm going to draw a line, right? So 20% up here and starts off in the 50s and it kind of does something like this. Oops. I, a terrible, terrible graph here but you're going to kind of get it right and then it goes to zero pops up a little bit it goes to zero again okay something like that okay so terrible drawing but i think you guys will get it the fed funds rate had gone all the way up to 20 percent by the early 1981 i think it's what it was it was just shy of 20 percent. it was like 19 something right and this is where the Fed funds rate was at in the early 80s in order to combat the inflationary scenario that was taking place in the 70s, right? This is the Volcker situation, right, that was happening. Since then, right, interest rates have fallen, right? So anytime there is a recession, right, the Federal Reserve would drop interest rates 5% to deal with the recession. Then in 2007 they ran into the great financial crisis. Well, interest rates were so low, they hit what they referred to as the lower bound of zero. So interest rates came down to zero and they went flat, right? So now there was no more dropping of interest rates to stimulate the economy, right? Because going below zero is no, is not has never been proven to be an effective way of actually stimulating the economy. So they considered zero to be the lower bound. Like you could not go any further than that. This is when the quantitative easing fired up, right? Because they knew back, you know, back all the way in early 2000 that they were going to be running into this situation. Right? And this is difficult to try and wrap your head around, I know. But if you can imagine that the Federal Reserve hits the lower bound of zero, now what? You can't, you, how do you stimulate the economy? You can't, right? Because people cannot go out there and borrow the money at a lower interest rate like they once did. However, if you put out the quantitative easing, right? So this is now when the Federal Reserve is going to step up and start buying treasury bonds. Now, the government has to have a place to spend this money. So they go into bailouts, stimulus spendings, doing all kinds of stuff with this newfound money that is coming from the quantitative easing. So they go massively into debt. Now this money starts finding its way into the economy and starts stimulating things. And again, this is all kind of in a nutshell, and a lot of people might argue with me about it, but this is ultimately how it went down, right? So now we think about it. This new money that starts flowing into the system and the idea of all the quantitative easing that is happening out there, right? Because you have to think, this is, this is quantitative easing from 2007 to 2008, or uh, it started in, um, from the great financial crisis of 2007 to 2008. The quantitative easing went on for years, and it was four rounds of it. But we, we have to think, like, it took the Fed's balance sheet $850 billion at the time to almost five trillion, it was four and a, over four and a half trillion dollars, right? Eight hundred and fifty billion to four and a half trillion dollars. It was a huge amount. Like all of a sudden, the like the Federal Reserve has like just exploded their balance sheet, 
And to kind of compare that to the last round of quantitative easing, although there was more money printed, they pretty much doubled the balance sheet. Back in the great financial crisis, they quadrupled it. So now if you can imagine what most people are probably thinking when you see this amount of money printing taking place, right? All of a sudden, the inflation expectation begins to rise. However, that money never really made it into the system, not like you would think it would, right? All this quantitative easing would create all this inflation, right? Now, it did raise the inflation expectation a little bit, but not enough, right? And that money did find its way into like the housing market, the bond market, the stock market, things that you borrow money for. That's what it went to, right? But as far as like the cost of living increase and stuff like that, it hardly did what it was that the Federal Reserve was looking for. And they were looking for that 2%, right? So all that money printing kind of failed the Fed, right? So now, here we are. The Federal Reserve is in like 2018, right? And they're trying to raise those interest rates because they're still at the lower bound of zero dealt, you know, from the quantitative easing or from the great financial crisis and all the quantitative easing that had taken place, from 10 years earlier. Now they're in 2018, they're trying to raise the rates, right? And they're in this autopilot program where they're raising rates a quarter point every quarter, right? And they're gonna try and do it like nonchalantly, like nobody's gonna notice, do to do, right? And they get it up to around like two and a half percent and the markets are flipping out. Like they do not like this information at all, right? So what's the Federal Reserve has to do, right? It's 2019. The markets are not happy. They can't get their Fed funds rates over 2.5%. They're hardly lifted off of the lower bound. And they start reducing rates. Remember, go and look at the chart. This is happening prior to 2000. This is happening prior to the to the to the pandemic recession, right? Because there, there was a recession already that has taken place, right? It was very short lived. It was very deep, quickest recession in history. Hardly anybody even remembers we had it, right? But there was a recession from the pandemic, the pandemic induced recession. I don't know if a lot of people remember it, but anyway, the Federal Reserve was lowering interest rates ahead of that, right? So it wasn't a pandemic induced recession. Just take a look at every single time the Federal Reserve has lowered interest rates, it's always happened into a recession. Every time, like pretty much without fail. Right. And it's not a guarantee and it's not every single time. But dang, right. I mean, we just came off of the longest expansion in history without a recession. And the Federal Reserve is lowering interest rates. And just a few months later, we have a pandemic induced recession. Okay. Anyway, take take from that what you will. Right. Okay. So what ends up happening there is that the Federal Reserve had their Fed funds rates at two and a half percent. The pandemic, they lowered them already. They're trying to stimulate the economy somehow they can because the markets are already pissed off about this two and a half percent level that they've achieved. Because really, you know, if you think about it from this terrible graph that I wrote, this is this is it right here, right? They had hit this two and a half percent, couldn't go any further, so they had to start dropping interest rates again. There was no stimulus happening. Right? Not from that. So the stimulus now had to come from another fashion. Right? And this is really where things start to get very tricky. right? Because now the Federal Reserve has moved their Fed funds rate right, down to zero for the pandemic. And this is an unusual and exigent circumstance taking place. Okay. With this unusual and exigent circumstance... Now they are able to start deploying tools that nobody knew that they would have, right? Maybe some people knew that they had it, but for the most part, most economists did not know that there would be things like the special purpose vehicle for the corporate debt lending facilities, right? So now all of a sudden, there's all these backstops for the economy, right? These special purpose vehicles, you got the payroll protection programs and all kinds of like, I mean, you can go and look at it. There's all kinds. We, in fact... We on this channel covered each and every single one of those debt lending facilities so that we could understand what it was that the Federal Reserve was setting up. But the biggest one was that corporate debt lending facility. That was the big and I'm not the biggest one to me was the biggest credible threat because that corporate debt lending facility was what actually gave the corporations the ability to gorge on incredibly cheap debt. People thought that the Federal Reserve was going to be buying into corporate debt and they started to front run them. 
At the same time, the quantitative easing was happening, which lowered the interest rates on the U.S. Treasuries, which then made the fixed income investors have to go and seek out something from anywhere, and they found it in the high yielding corporate debt, which drove the yields down on corporate debt even more. So this was a big bailout for the corporations. And this is, I, I know that part is very difficult for a lot of people who have no, like who are just trying to learn this, that just flew right over their head. They have no clue of what happened there. But we've, done, we've covered this quite a bit, right? This, was, this is very important to understand. Nobody really brings this up that much, right? That these corporations were bailed out during that time just off of the credible threat that the Federal Reserve was going to be buying into these corporations, buying, like buying their debt, buying their bonds. But they didn't do it. They bought a little bit, right? Established a credible threat, but it was the markets itself that ran in there and, and, and basically provided the funding that all these corporations needed during the pandemic. It was, it was like a perfectly executed plan. All right. Okay, so inflation starts to rip, right? You got the quantitative easing. You got all this stimulus, like stimulus checks, that are running out there for people, not just government spending, right? And people borrowing money, but you got actual cash right into their bank account saying, go out there and start spending money. At the same time, you got a severing of the supply chain. This supply demand imbalance is what really drove the inflation. See, this is really important to understand because the Federal Reserve was looking help, looking for help to combat inflation from the supply side of things. Look at a lot of their statements that they make out there. Hope They they basically said supply is coming back, which has brought inflation down. If it's the supply, then it wasn't the money printer. They haven't really retracted that much money yet. They, yes, they are in quantitative tightening where they're you know pulling money out of the system, but they haven't gone through that much to return inflation back to its normal, right? It should still be running rampant according to the money printing you know theory of it. But really good fair amount of this had to do with the supply chain breakdown and that stimulus package that went out at the same time. This is what caused the supply demand imbalance. Now, the Federal Reserve is starting to raise rates to combat the inflation. Right? This is after years of keeping interest rates incredibly low for an extended period of time. They were attempting to get inflation up. They needed inflation to run higher. And now I know, again, this is another one that a lot of people are like, what in the world? If this is the first time they've ever heard that, then they really don't understand. Like, they, they, that just blows their mind. They're like, what? I just, I'm completely lost here now. Right? But yes, the Federal Reserve needed inflation. Right? They had a very low inflation expectation taking place at the time, and it was interfering with their monetary policy. And the reason is, is because of that lower bound of zero. They couldn't drop interest rates any lower. See, if inflation was running higher, then they could raise their interest rates, the Fed funds rate, in order to combat the inflation. But without the inflation expectation, there is no inflation, and therefore it interferes with their monetary policy. Just listen to this. Today, we face an altogether different set of problems stemming from a very low neutral interest rate. And I'll explain this neutral interest rate and what he means here in just a second. That is the short-term real interest rate consistent with an economy operating at its potential alongside low and stable inflation. Ironically, the problem we need to solve these days is the risk of inflation that is persistently too low rather than too high. Very interesting to think about, right? This is what was interfering with their monetary policy is that they had a very low neutral interest rate and the inflation expectation was persistently too low. This speech was given November 30th of 2018, right? Not that long ago. Okay, so now let's talk about this, this situation that we are now in because this is really what the important part is, right? It's just like, okay, inflation is coming down. Interest rates are elevated, and everybody believes that the Federal Reserve is going to be dropping interest rates into the future. Just know this. The Federal Reserve does not generally drop interest rates unless there is some bad economic times taking place. Okay? Just to know that. If we have good economic times, then the Federal Reserve probably will not be lowering interest rates. 
But if there's bad economic times, then the Federal Reserve will try to stimulate the economy with the dropping of interest rates. This is how it typically works. Now, good, bad economy, that's really how you position yourself. There is no such thing as a good or bad economy. It's just an economy that is. If somebody is telling you it's a bad economy, it's because of their opinion on the position that they have put themselves in and suggesting that you put yourself in that is going to put make it to be a bad economy. A bad economy is not, is this really relative to what, what you're experiencing from the position that you have put yourself in. Okay. Let's talk about this, the situation that we are now in with the Fed funds rates being elevated. Okay. And the neutral interest rate and inflation and all that other stuff. Okay. So right now, this is, this is going to be very difficult for a lot of, for a lot of people to wrap their heads around because the neutral interest rate is not something that is set. There is no, there's no like chart. I mean, the Federal Reserve refers to it as R star. So there is places that you can go to that will talk about the neutral interest rate, but the, there, there is no, like, nobody knows. It's like almost imaginary. Like, you know, it's just like, there is a neutral interest rate, but nobody knows exactly what that is. Right. And so if, again, like the neutral interest rate is when the Fed funds rate is neither accommodating nor restricting the economy. And and if you think about it, like if you cannot, if you have the neutral interest rate close to zero, like it's at 1%, dropping the, the, in, dropping the Fed funds rate for far enough below that neutral interest rate to stimulate the economy becomes ineffective, right? So this is the part to remember. This is one of the reasons why they needed a higher inflation expectation and they needed inflation to run rampant is so that they would have the ability to combat that inflation with the raising of interest rates. And that's essentially getting their, their ammo back, right? So now what ended up happening is, is they kept interest rates very low, right? They kept them near zero for an extended period of time, which drove the inflation and got that very hot. But then they very quickly raised interest rates up, right? And we're just going to assume that they're going to plateau out for a while. All right. Sometime in 2024, right? They're thinking towards the end of 2024 that they're going to start lowering them down a little bit. All right? But we don't know exactly how much or how far they think that there's going to be two or three rate cuts back then to finish off the year. Okay? And now this is this is kind of like the idea that is going to end up taking place. Again, the Fed funds rate remained zero for a long time. You know, a little over a year ago they started raising rates. Was it a year ago? Gosh, was it that long? Gee, was. Okay. Uh, they got it up to their current level, which is a little over 5%, and we're going to assume that they're going to plateau out. All right. Here is where it starts getting very confusing because when the inflation comes down, right, so the idea that when the inflation comes down, the Federal Reserve would want to adjust their Fed funds rate to accommodate to land for a 2% target inflation rate. So if we can assume... Inflation comes down to 2% sometime here in, you know, in 2024, right? It gets down to 2% that the Federal Reserve would want to adjust their Fed funds rate to accommodate the economy in the interest rate levels to maintain that 2% target. But that's not what's going to end up happening, right? It's going to be a 2% average inflation rate over time. So we don't know exactly how or when that 2% inflation, 2% average inflation rate over time has been achieved because the Federal Reserve doesn't really articulate that to us on how that's going to be conducted. It's like almost arbitrary to them. Okay. Now, let's take, for example, the neutral interest rate. Let's just say it was at zero, but as inflation was running hot, let me use a different pen. The neutral interest rate was zero, but as inflation started running hot, the neutral interest rate starts to rise. Okay. Now, we don't know exactly how much. We just know that because of the inflation expectation and the higher interest rates and the more expensive everything is, that this neutral interest rate is going to start moving up. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm just going to assume that when this plateaus out, right, when the Fed funds rate peaks out, that the neutral interest rate will probably continue to move around some. Whether it goes up or down, I think that will have to do with the expectations that is coming to the future. Right? Now, if it does move and the Federal Reserve stays still, the gap between the two can widen or shrink without the Federal Reserve doing anything at all. This is important to remember. 
okay? This is like, I think this is probably one of the key parts of this whole video right now is just what I just said, okay? Is that the neutral interest rate, which is not necessarily set and there's no real way of determining what it is, can move and the Fed funds rate stays where it is. If it moves closer to the Fed funds rate, it can have the same effect as if the Fed was lowering rates. This is something very interesting to think about because the Federal Reserve can stay stand still and yet have a very less restrictive economy coming into the future simply by, by the neutral interest rate rising. Now, if you have a neutral interest rate that rises, let's just say it does, right? you know, I'm a complete assumption, it could go down, but let's just say that it happens to rise or even just you know kind of maintains where it's at, right? If we can assume that's to take place, okay, the economy is less restrictive at that time. The, the less restrictive economy is therefore hotter than what a lot of people would anticipate it being because of this less restrictive situation with the neutral interest rate rising, that the inflation scenario could continue. See, right now, the way the inflation is coming down, people aren't really thinking about what it is that's going to impact the neutral interest rate and whether or not that's going to continue to go up or down. Right? The Federal Reserve is continuing to tighten up their, their, their uh, balance sheet, right? which is going to create a situation with liquidity going into the future. Right? So again, we have to think, like, what is it that is going to be taking place when all of a sudden you have liquidity tightening, right? at the same time, you have Fed funds rates that have maintained, have stopped. You have inflation starting to come down. Right? The neutral interest rate that's involved with all this right? and what kind of impact that would have on the economy as the inflation comes down. Again, we have to put all these pieces in. I know a lot of people are probably just swimming right now like, dude, man, what in the hell? Like, I can't even follow anything that you're saying right now, right? But this is all happening, right? You got to take it all into consideration. You got to know each and every one of these working parts. Because what's going to end up happening is, is that if we get into the future and we have inflation ramp up, for many, it could be many reasons. It could be due to the fact that the economy is becoming less restrictive, from the neutral interest rate, it could happen from manufacturing slowdown that is then depleting the economy of, of goods and the supply and demand, demand imbalances continue. Right? There's a lot of forms of inflation that could be coming, coming down, you know, uh, higher interest rates have a return on capital investment. This return on capital investment means that you have now more money coming in in an interest payment due to your savings or investments that you have put in. You can now take that return on in, on in, on your capital and participate back into the economy with it. This is, could be an inflationary environment from it. See, low interest rates is a disinflation is a deflationary environment. Now, a lot of people don't don't know that, right? They look at low interest rates as being all inflationary, but that's not true. It can be very de deflationary as the return on capital investment goes to zero. And then the return on capital investment after inflation becomes negative. Okay? Again, this is like, you know, uh, this is pretty difficult stuff to wrap your head around, but I'll explain it real quickly for you. If you can imagine inheriting a, inheriting a million dollars back in the early 80s, you loan that money to the government, you'll get a return of somewhere around, you know, 15%. $150,000 a year, that's a lot of money that you can spend back into the economy buying houses and cars and going on vacation. Well, prior to the pandemic, right, the U.S. Treasuries were trading at all-time lows. You loaned your money to the U.S. government for 10 years, you would get a return of like $20,000 for a million-dollar loan. right? That's hardly enough to live off of. That's not a lot of money that you can return back into the economy. So higher paying interest rates has a higher return on capital investment that has an inflationary pressure within the economy itself. This is something we have to think about going into the future. Okay. 
So just because you have a dot plot that's saying somewhere around that the Fed funds rate is going to be falling going into the future, we have to think about the neutral interest rate and its impact on the Fed funds rate if it was to continue making the economy less restrictive, adding less adding inflationary pressure to the economy. Again, this is stuff to think about. I don't want to make this video any longer. I think I've covered way too much stuff already. I didn't even want it to be that complicated. I was hoping this was going to be like a 10 minute video and I'm now 35 minutes into it. So I'm just going to end it here and we'll do it again another time. All right. Uneducated economist, you let me know.